Okay. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very happy that you're joining us for uh, what I would say is a very important seminar, uh, the last seminar of this academic year. There will be another seminar in March 11, which I uh, March uh, 2nd, which I'll announce at the end of the of our seminar. But uh, I'm very happy you you join us because we know this is a very important topic uh, topic uh, that we thought uh, required further attention. It's a topic that hits very close to home. Uh, many, many people, several people in the room here, are in one way or another confronted with it. I'm always reminded about it myself, uh, how easy you can be affected by it when, um, because I, I, I actually still have to bring back to the pharmacist uh, bottle of pills here uh, with uh, oxycodone. I broke my hip two years ago, uh, was in the hospital and was already say, educated about some of the risks of opioid addiction and emailed one of, um, one of our colleagues, uh, David Yearling, who is a um, the pain specialist at, uh, at uh, Sunny Group, because they were going to prescribe me opioids as a as pain relief medication while I was in the hospital. And what, would it not have been for him, I think I would have taken this entire, or maybe this entire lot of pain relief medication, which uh, actually will bring, will bring back today, I just reminded of it when I was uh, coming to the seminar. Um, and it, it, I, I got a prescription for several, basically, say, certainly uh, more than a week, several weeks of, um, of pain relief medication that I could have taken at home. But his warning from on e by email in the hospital bed was uh, reduce as much as possible the, take, the you know, your intake of oxycodone and limit it to a maximum of five days. Um, it wasn't on the on the bottle. It was no specific warning. I actually had to discuss with the with the pain nurse to some extent why I was worried about about uh, taking this medication. I think this is simply is a as a very brief introduction to a seminar. Uh, that, um, that I think uh, deals with, with one of the biggest public health crises of the last couple of years in, in a Canadian context. So I'm very happy um, that we're being joined by uh, two policy specialists. One, uh, I would argue, patient advocate, but also lawyer, a colleague um, uh, who is uh, finishing her, her doctorate at Osgoods. So let me briefly introduce them, and then we'll get going. So I will primarily moderate the session. I have a couple of key questions that will ask the uh, presenters, but I will have some things to say about uh, some of the legal options. And we will, in the fall, organize a more extensive discussion about what are the concrete legal tools that we can use to, to deal with the crisis. So the goal of today is really to focus more on what is, the, what is happening, or where are we today, what has been done, and what needs to be done urgently to uh, counter the, um, the many, uh, the, the thousands of Canadians who are affected actually by, by the opioid crisis. So Tara Gomez uh, will be the first to speak after I uh, formulate the first question. She's an epidemiologist and principal investigator of the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network. She's a scientist in the Di Ka Ching Knowledge Institute of St. Michael's Hospital and the Institute of Clinical for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. She's also an assistant professor at UFT. Her research focuses on pharmacoepidemiology, <coughs> drug safety, and drug policy research. Uh, she leveraged large administrative databases, and she has published uh, multiple, uh, more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, over 50 policy reports in this area. She has worked with, the, with policyholders, with the Ontario Ministry of Health and the US Food and Drug Administration. Then we're uh, is an epidemiologist and policy analyst with expertise in HIV addictions and drug policy. He's also a scientist at St. Michael's Hospital uh, and holds a dual appointment uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health at University of <coughs> California, San Diego, and the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation here at U of T. He received um, an award of the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse um, for creative new investigators proposing highly innovative research at the intersection of HIV and substance use. And he has received further support um, uh, and uh, including a Trailblazer Award from the Canadian Institute of Health Research. 
There are numerous other things, so I'll keep it, I'll keep it at that. So Sheila Jennings is a proud mother of three young adults, which um, explains also her advocacy work with Moms Stop the Harm. Um, she's also a sessional instructor in the Department of Legal Studies at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And she'll be defending her doctoral thesis on disability rights uh, in, uh, at Osgoode Hall uh, this, uh, this coming spring. Um, and myself, well, uh, I have introduced myself already before, but um, in this particular context, I'm also a member of a Health Canada expert advisory group on the marketing of opioids. I will say something very briefly about some of the initiatives that Health Canada is doing, but I will not be speaking in that particular capacity. So I'm more here to moderate and to provide some, some legal comments. So without further ado, um, let me start with the first question to um, our, uh, what do we know about the opioid crisis? What is currently happening? And what research is done to understand the crisis? Well, thanks uh, for having me, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, I think what I wanted to do, and hopefully this will just set up as an introduction to the rest of the comments as well, is talk a little bit about how we kind of got here, and then how this whole environment has shifted over time, and what we can learn from that, because I think there's a lot that can be accomplished by seeing where we had success in, and where we made mistakes in the past, so that we can try and make better policy decisions in the future. So, you know, if we think about opioid prescribing, and Trudeau's already spoken a little bit about his experiences with that, um, a lot of, you know, people have used opioids for centuries, and we know that. That's not, this isn't something new. But a lot of the real change that happened with the way in which opioids were being prescribed happened in the late 90s and early 2000s. Before that time, if you look at prescribing rates in Ontario, they were pretty low and pretty steady. But what happened was that a new formulation of an opioid called OxyContin was added to the market around that time. This was being marketed as being a safer alternative to what had currently existed, which was these shorter acting forms, because this was a long acting form. You could take it twice a day, you would get pain relief sustained over the course of the day, and you wouldn't have these peaks and valleys of pain relief. So this was seen as a real advancement in, in treating pain. Um, it was marketed very heavily by Purdue, the manufacturer, as being safe, having low risk of addiction because of its sustained properties, um, and, and, and not really leading to addiction or opioid use disorder. But what we really quickly found was that, that that wasn't necessarily the case, because these pills could be used in different ways. They could be crushed and inhaled, or they could be dissolved, and people could get all of that drug that was meant to be used over the course of the day all at once, which could lead to a high and could, um, <coughs> could lead to negative consequences for some people. What I think is important to know about this is because of that heavy marketing, the fact that the people were told, and clinicians were told, these were safe to treat chronic pain long term, even though if you look at the research, there's very little long term research to show that opioids for chronic pain are safe and effective. Um, we started to see this, this quick climb in the rate at which people were being exposed to opioids across Ontario and across North America. So you start to see this increase. I'm, I'm a hand talker, so I don't have slides, but I'll use my hands. So we started to see this increase in, in <coughs> opioid prescribing and largely oxycodone, which is the opioid with an oxycontin prescribing. And when you look at opioid-related deaths, you see really similar trends. So in the 90s, deaths were pretty stable. We had opioid-related deaths, but they were pretty rare and pretty stable. Around 2000, when oxycontin started to take off in prescribing, you see opioid-related deaths start to take off. And when you look at the drugs that were responsible for those deaths, it was largely oxycodone. So there's a really clear tie between those prescribing trends and the overdose trends that we saw. And that continued really throughout the 2000s until 2010, 2012, when the manufacturer of OxyContin released a new form of, um, of OxyContin called OxyNeo. And they marketed this as being a tamper deterrent form. So let's try and avoid all the risks of OxyContin. And you might think, well, that's great. They were really like listening. and responding to the issue, but really the reality is that their patent was expiring and so by introducing a new brand name agent, they were going to pretty much try and keep hold of the market for opioids that had been very profitable for them for quite some time. So, so we saw this transition to this tamper deterrent form, but we also saw a lot of other policies start to come out because people really started to pay attention to the fact that opioid prescribing was rising and so were overdoses. So we saw um, Canadian guidelines come out around prescribing for chronic non-cancer pain. We saw governments start to change the way they funded opioids and actually put some restrictions in place on how they funded these prescriptions. And we also saw that colleges started to talk about investigating prescribers and trying to identify these high prescribers and rein in this over-prescribing that was happening. 
So this all happened you know, around 2010, 2012. And if you look at prescribing trends at that time, we started to see them really level off. So you could think, okay, this is positive, attention is raised around this issue, and we start to see opioid prescription trends change. Um, so then you look at overdoses and think, well, in theory, overdoses should plateau, we should see less overdoses. And in fact, we saw the opposite. We saw the rate at which people are dying of opioid overdoses just start to climb astronomically. So it, it accelerated. And the question becomes, well, why? If, we're, if prescription opioids were the driver of this and the lever of this, then why would you change that? Our overdose is not changing. And I think this is really the crux of the issue and how things really have changed in the environment. Because as opioid prescribing changed, people were hearing from their doctors that they wouldn't prescribe opioids anymore or wouldn't prescribe them at the doses that they had previously prescribed them. However, a lot of people had developed either a dependence, so their body had become used to those drugs, and so they had a dependence on those drugs, or some kind of opioid use disorder, so some kind of addiction to those drugs. Taking away a prescription opioid when somebody has developed a dependence or tolerance or um, addiction to them, to these drugs, doesn't mean that they're just simply going to stop taking them and say, okay, well, great, that's fine. This is, a, this is a physiological response in your body, so people are going to look for alternative sources. And they're going to need to, they're not just going to watch it, they're going to need to, to avoid going into withdrawal. So we started to see this swing of people starting to access opioids through the illicit market. And that market is inherently less safe. So they went from a, a prescription opioid where they knew what they were getting to the illicit market where initially it was, it was heroin around 2012. We started to see heroin really contributing to these deaths. And then very quickly the illicit fentanyl that you know, is in the media now and a lot of people are talking about came in. So we started to see the illicit fentanyl come in and given its potency, it's so potent that a small amount can be brought over borders in a way that is very hard for people to capture and then cut into large amounts of drugs. You started to see that street supply get really unsafe, more people using it, and this huge <coughs> spike in opioid overdoses and deaths. So, so to me, you know, my research, and I think where we're going now and, and where we have to think about is that this, there's really been this kind of pendulum swing in the way in which opioids are being prescribed from kind of over-prescribing to now perhaps under-prescribing and, and at least a, sh a big shift for people who have previously sourced them in this way. And we've also then seen a swing in the types of opioids that are leading to overdoses. So we need to start to think about policy responses and how we adequately and appropriately address what's happening now. So focusing on the prescription side is not going to avoid the deaths that we're seeing right now because they are largely not being driven by prescription opioids. Um, some, of the, some of the work we've been doing very quickly um, has been looking at what is contributing to these deaths. I think that's important in trying to figure out what we do next. So if we're trying to avoid deaths, what are the opioids that are contributing to these deaths? Um, most recent, in the most recent data we have, about three quarters are illicit fentanyl. So we know fentanyl and the illicit supply is a huge driver of deaths. We still see that there are you know, 20 to 25% of deaths that are involved prescription opioids. So there still is some role of prescription opioids in this, but it is definitely largely um, an illicit fentanyl um, issue. And then I guess the other side, and what I think has been really important, is trying to understand these policies, these new guidelines that are coming out, the attention that has been pla placed on clinicians to try and more appropriately prescribe these drugs and look at what, what are those consequences for patients, both chronic pain patients and people who use, who use opioids for any reason. And one of the things we've been looking at is um, drastically reducing doses or cutting patients off from their opioids, and that's something that we hear a lot about when we speak with people who use opioids, that they've had um, these dramatic dose reductions or, or simply have their physician say, I'm scared of the college investigating me, so I'm washing my hands of my opioid patients so that I look better on those indicators of, how many of your patients get an opioid, it looks much better. But then they're basically abandoning these patients who then are having to seek other sources and, and support. And, and these patients are also losing access to primary care. It's not just around the opioids, they're losing mm -hmm. access to primary care and, and the healthcare system. So we've been trying to work with uh, patients to understand what those issues are and incorporate that into research to quantify it in a way that we can then show government clinicians, colleges to say, this isn't okay, and the way that these policies are actually being rolled out is maybe causing more harm than good, and maybe we need to rethink our approach. Mm -hmm. Very good introduction. So that actually your last comment certainly leads us to my uh, second question, because it seems that some type of reaction towards the problem of overprescription of opioids, so some legal regulatory intervention led to, led to particular harms 
and makes us understand what the, what the positive but also the negative consequences can be of, uh, of regulatory intervention. So I, I would ask uh, uh, Dan maybe to briefly comment on, on, on what are the kind of legal regulatory contributors that you as a policy analyst see to the crisis and, and what kind of policy interventions broadly conceived <coughs> are happening and, and what are the consequences of these policies? Sure. So that was awesome. I, you covered, I think, all the obviously the really important points. I, I would add like one thing to the emergence of Oxycon. There's a real, you know, Oxycon is amazing because it, it was this kind of marvel of R&D, but it was also a marvel of marketing. So one of the amazing things that Purdue did was look at the pain market and look at, you know, at the time before OxyContin was introduced to the market, opioids were basically used primarily for cancer-related pain, which makes up, you know, this much of the entire patient population that requires pain management. They looked at this huge population of patients that were experiencing pain and thought, why don't we just start marketing to this much larger non-malignant pain category? And that's what they did. And as uh, was described, you know, they did it really effectively. What's really troubling is that the claims around the non-addictive, the, the sort of non-addictiveness of OxyContin basically all boil down to one brief report in a, in a medical journal that had, like it was a cohort study of, I, I can't remember, like a... It's this long. This is it. Yeah, it's like Four one, sentences long. one paragraph <laughs> saying, basically, yeah, we had this small study and we found that OxyContin wasn't addictive. Now, that is like absolutely not what you would call evidence-based medicine. Um, and in point of fact, despite this being published in a peer-reviewed um, journal, Purdue knew that it was fraudulent. So like, they have been successfully prosecuted for fraud. So when we, I, I just think it's important that that, you know, people <coughs> recognize that this is a case initially of corporate malpractice. So that, you know, and, and it was extremely explicitly done. Um, the people who were in charge of marketing and producing this um, did it knowing uh, that this was an extremely risky product. Now, I also want to step back. We're here talking about talking about tackling the opioid crisis. What is an opioid crisis? Like, are we talking about a drug? Are we talking about overdose? Is it an opioid use crisis? Is it an opioid overdose crisis? Um, I think you did a great job of sort of disentangling those, but I think it's when we think about this set of interconnected uh, phenomena, I think it's really important to be semantically correct because that leads to more specific and nuanced policy. So we have two things happening. We have one, an expansion in the overall population of people who use opioids as a result of overprescribing. So it's sort of an opioid use crisis, if you want to call it a crisis. And then we also have an opioid overdose crisis, which is related, but as you described really well, it's increasingly separate, right? So the drivers of the expansion of the opioid use crisis are now, you know, not really driving um, the opioid overdose crisis, which is increasingly driven, <coughs> or primarily driven, you could say now, by um, illegal uh, fentanyl and, you know, these super high potency toxic adulterants. So, you know, the emergence of fentanyl, and you know, you, the question was around policy-related causes. We have seen since, you know, since the days of opium, opium trading in the 19th century, a very predictable stepwise increase in the potency of <coughs> opioid products. From opium, to laudanum, to heroin, to morphine, then fentanyl, car fentanyl, like what we're seeing, this, like fentanyl is extremely predictable. It's the predictable result of using supply side <laughs> interventions to try to manage an illegal market. And basically what you do is you pressure a market 
and it creates efficiencies. So, you know, you pressure a market, and often market pressure comes in regulatory settings from consumer choice and things like that. So companies have to compete against each other to make the best product. In this case, you've got drug producers and traffickers that are competing against supply side, you know, basically law enforcement and counter narcotics. And they are creating increasingly efficient products. And when we talk about efficiency in illegal drug markets, we're really talking about potency. Because as you described, like if you can get as much opioid in a package this big as this big, and you have to get through a bunch of orders, what do you like? The choice is clear. Um, so you know, people. I'm often confronted with a question like, how like is fentanyl here to stay? It's so incredibly deadly. Like personally, <coughs> I don't see from a policy perspective, from like a market efficiency perspective that we're gonna see any reverse transitions to more inefficient products anytime soon if the illegal market is left to its own devices. Um, and that should really scare people because you know this is not necessarily gonna go away. And to put it in extremely blunt terms, you know, traffickers are not interested necessarily in the people that are dying unless the overall number of deaths starts impacting the bottom line. And I think when you're looking at a market that is estimated, like there's a global market uh, for illegal drugs that's estimated to be as valuable as oil or, or close to that, you know, there's got to be a lot more people dying. So I don't think that we should be leaving it up to the illegal market and hoping against hope that, you know, we're going to somehow see reverse transitions to less potent opioid products without some kind of intervention. I feel like I've done all my time. No, I've got a little bit. So one other specific point that I want to jump on that, that you mentioned was the, the, the removal of OxyContin from the formulary, or basically Purdue's decision to remove it and replace it with OxyNeo, which was a tamper-resistant formula, which a lot of people uh, didn't want to use. Um, and you know, I think this caught, like government was certainly aware that OxyContin was going to be removed from the market. And I think, you know, my speculation is that because the history of, inter of intervention in drug markets has been so ineffective at, chip, you know, at, at reducing supply, that governments did not really understand. And here I'm talking about the, the Canadian government and the US government. I think they really were aware that there would be a massive structural shift in the drug market with the removal of this one formulation. And that resulted in this massive gap in the market that was filled in the way that you described, right? Through people shifting to um, the illegal market. But what that also meant was that governments did not take into account the kind of sequencing of interventions and policies that could have prevented people who were, you know, suddenly saw a source of drugs that they were dependent on removed, that the government, the governments did not take into account the fact that that was a problem that was probably going to be needed, that was going to be needed to respond to, that, if my grammar makes sense. So essentially, you know, you, if you're, if you're, in a, if you're a policymaker and you understand that a opioid like OxyContin that a number of people are dependent on, that a number of people uh, are prescribed, is going to suddenly be removed, I think you know you have to, like in hindsight is 2020, but in, in retrospect, you know, obviously having a functioning treatment system for people who are experiencing opioid use disorders ensuring access to treatment on the one hand, ensuring access to harm reduction like naloxone, supervised consumption sites, all these effective ways that we know we can prevent people from overdosing and dying, or from dying of overdose, I should say. These should all have been scaled up at the time of the delisting or the removal of OxyContin, rather than what, are we, we're like six years past and, and only last year was there this huge commitment to improve access to harm reduction, let alone treatment. Um, you know, so that gap is really fatal, where you've got a policy shift 
where a prescribed drug is suddenly removed. You've got a vacuum in terms of supply with predictable results. And then only about five, six years later do you see any kind of applied policy starting to take shape. So maybe I'll leave it. So you're, so you're suggesting in a way that some of the initiatives that we will be discussing about focusing on the legal market is, is too little too late. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Like, there, you, as you described very aptly, like, they're the precursors and the, 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 the initial kind of warning flags about this predated even the time of delisting the BoxyCon. Um, but, you know, we're talking about a super stigmatized activity. Um, and I, I use this analogy, so uh, apologies if, if you've heard it before, but, you know, we're, what we're now dealing with is a contaminated opioid supply. If there were a contaminated water supply, how quickly would the policy levers rush into action? Without any sense of, you know, is it appropriate? Like, people are dependent on water. Like, should we, shouldn't we be working to, you know, re not enable people's water dependence? You know, like, all these kinds of questions, like people ask about stigma. To me, this is stigma, right? Where you've got people who are going to die because they are dependent on a particular supply. The gap between the response to a contaminated water supply in Toronto versus a contaminated opioid supply in Toronto. The gap in terms of the amount of uh, resources thrown at it and, the, and really the speed at which the issue is resolved, that is stigma. People have been around long enough to remember Walkerton and if you compare the number of deaths or people injured in Walkerton compared to the yeah. opioid crisis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let, let's um, um, go back to the two, um, so we've discussed a little bit the broad policy option, the, uh, the statistics of what is going on. Um, Sheila, um, could you tell us more about the experience on the ground and the role of advocacy and what people are really dealing with? Sure. Um, I just want to make a comment before I talk about the role of advocacy and what's happening on the ground from the perspective of family. So I'm here as uh, the face of family. I'm not here today as someone who's been doing research in health law. Or, um, I will say, however, that last month I taught my undergrads um, a class on the opioid crisis, which was very interesting for me to do. It was also uh, a sort of a more of a clinical kind of a talk, and it wasn't emotionally engaged in the talk at all. Um, I was a little bit shocked to discover that after, out of a class of 50 people, only one knew what naloxone was in 2019. That absolutely floored me. And two or three sort of knew what fentanyl was because they'd seen it in the news. So if we think that everyone's up to speed on this crisis, we're very much mistaken. These were very bright students in their 20s. Um, and they were very interested. And that a number of them have gone on to do projects on case law that has come up in different uh, in human rights tribunals and elsewhere. Uh, criminal law uh, concerning people ensnared is what I would call it uh, in the opioid crisis. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, Mom Stop the Harm. Um, who's heard of Mom Stop the Harm before? So some people have. So um, I'm an advocate with Mom Stop the Harm and for those of you who don't know, um, we're a network of Canadian families whose loved ones have died uh, from drug related harms or who have or who are now struggling with substance use. Um, Mom Stop the, the Harm has a very singular view. We call for an end to the failed war on drugs, and we advocate for approaches that reduce harm and that respect the human rights of people who use drugs. Um, so from where we sit, people who use, who use drugs should not be criminalized, and they must be treated with compassion and respect. Um, Mom Stop the Harm is a national organization with about 800 families who are members now. Mostly, however, it's moms who are doing the advocacy, the advocacy and the advocating. 75% of those 800 mothers have a deceased child. Um, some have, one mom has two uh, young men who died. Another one, her only son died. And these, have, these women have turned out to be phenomenal advocates. Um, I also want to note that we're just one of many organizations doing grassroots advocacy 
which isn't totally grassroots. There's a lot of high-level stuff that's going on. Um, there's names, for example, Niagara Area Moms Ending Stigma with Sandy Walker, Tangerdini, and Jennifer Johnston, who are doing, who both lost sons to the opioid crisis, who are both doing fabulous uh, advocacy around having supervised consumption sites in their area. Um, just turning um, to the role of advocates, you can advocate, you can become an advocate in anything, right? Like you could be a high school student who is very concerned about the environment and, be, and go in and, and volunteer with Greenpeace. We're in kind of a different situation. Um, siblings who are members have lost their, their only brother, for example. And of course, 85% roughly of those who are dying are young men. And that is something that, that needs to be borne in mind when we're looking for solutions to this crisis, not to ignore those 15 uh, rough percentages of, of young women and older women, of course. So the role of us as advocates um, has been summarized for me uh, quite nicely, I think, by Pekka Schultz, who is one of the co-founding uh, moms in Mom Stop the Harm. And she has summarized that it's our job to ask the tough questions. Um, these questions can be tough enough um, that it can put our careers at risk and it can cause people to lose jobs. Um, just like supporting our young adults has caused several people to lose their jobs. Um, we need to, to say and learn to say what we need to say in a non-political, non-blaming way, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, we always advocate with the aim of ensuring that thousands of deaths don't become the new normal. And it's never entirely clear that we are winning um, in our aim in this regard, in this regard, because death is normal now. So we actually need to turn that back. Uh, two more of our aims before I talk a little bit about myself and um, some of the things that I've learned. We also seek to open the hearts and minds of Canadians in every province and territory with respect to what's happening on the ground as well as in law and policy. But the persistent goal is simple. If you were to say, what's the one thing that needs to be done right, right now is to stop the deaths. And just, that should be the mantra. So I'm going to re relay a little bit about my immediate family situation. And then I'm going to just read through a series of what are basically bullet points as to things that I've learned. And they might sound a little bit staccato when I get to them, but behind each one of those bullet points is a whole world of law and policy and all kinds of stuff that's going on. So, you know, at the end we can, you know, take up one of those points. So I'll ask people to just um, bear with me to take a sip of water. So, <clears throat> as Trudeau mentioned, I have three adult children and I'm fortunate to be very close to all three of them. Um, they're also loved by their grandmother and their extended family and their in-laws. Um, their father is a long-time emergency room physician living in another province, and I mention that for reasons I will explain later. Um, our eldest child, um, whose name I will not say today, um, has consented to me talking about specific points in his, what is effectively his medical history, right? So there's some things that I don't have consent to talk about, so what you learn about him is all that, that I will be able to share. However, he was a child with uh, severe complex medical problems throughout childhood and adolescence. He was prescribed painkillers from a very early age, all kinds and frequently, in childhood and as, a, as an adult, well, as a teenager and then as a young adult. He dealt with life-threatening illnesses and recurrent serious infections. And really, it's a miracle that he's alive today, just from that. These conditions and life threats set him up for severe anxiety, and nothing could really tame that. Um, however, in spite, of, in spite of that, or perhaps because of that, he landed in adulthood somehow physically resilient, for which I am forever grateful. You might think that growing up medically complex would have the opposite effect. Um, and I say physically resilient because my son has survived numerous overdoses, while many have died after just one. So as I say, I have his consent to disclose a number of incidents in the interest only of collectively stopping the deaths and near deaths 
and in aiding our efforts to build a bridge over the very dangerous waters of the current epidemic. On last count, almost 20 people in my son's circle have died since 2014. The most recent one that I know of was a female friend who died of infective endocarditis here in Toronto, and I count her death as an opioid death, but to my knowledge, Ontario does not. And this is common. Our living children grieve many, and the numbers grow. One of the moms in Mom Stop the Harm commented about a youth in her circle having attended five funerals of peers before any of them had attended a single wedding. So in order to amplify just a few and just a few of the hidden corners of this epidemic in my introduction, I'm going to tell you a point form, as I mentioned, a few of the things I know. And as I say, behind each item is a world of gaps in healthcare problems with criminal law and with social policy, as well as a range of deep-seated societal issues. First though, how do I know the things I'm going to list? Well, I know them because I've met with many, many bereaved mothers and siblings, and I've also met with a few bereaved fathers as well. We don't think about the bereaved fathers as much as we, we probably should. And because I've met uh, and continue to meet with those with loved ones seeking recovery who are struggling fiercely to survive. I communicate with these folks every day. I also know what I know because people who've overdosed have told me things, including yesterday someone who works at a supervised consumption site in Vancouver uh, tweeted me something that really shocked me, so even after all this time I'm still learning. Uh, I know the backstories to literally hundreds of untimely deaths, survived overdoses, um, and as I mentioned earlier, op uh, overdose can happen to anyone's child, and overdoses do not discriminate, even though we do. So I'd like to go through some things which I preface with, I know, because although it's anecdotal, I know because I've seen it, um, I've learned about it, um, or experienced it. So I know that this crisis has been going on for too long. My son returned from out west initially in 2014 to attend a funeral of a friend whose body was flown back from Alberta. His friend had died of an overdose. He was just 23 years old, and my son grieved his loss. I know that my son overdosed in the Tim Hortons bathroom in Calgary in 2015. He was subsequently dumped in the parking lot there, and it was winter. I know that an unknown woman came over to him, called 911, and waited for him with an, for an ambulance to come. And I know that his heart stopped that day, yet he survived that horror story. I grieved when I heard that story. I tell it to myself, and that's the story that lives on. I know that other people's sons and daughters have likewise been dumped, both while dead and barely alive. And the reasons for this vary. But we at Mom Stop the Harm know that stigma underlays each and every example. That and a lack of status recognition of people who use drugs as rights holders. I know that tough love does not reduce harm, and that rock bottom is the city morgue, an alleyway, or an empty stairwell. I know that I have not once been called by an ER admin during an overdose, even though I am listed as next of kin. I know that after an overdose and an ambulance ride, and after having had Narcan sprayed up his nose in 2017, my son was released to the street in the month of November in his sock feet with no coat and $10 in his pocket. He was able to cab home, and I know this because I collected him from his apartment that same night. I know that many other parents live and have lived this very same story with discharge from ER to street, or they did until they started to live with the story of being bereaved when a child went directly from the ER to use again. And I know families face complex grief as a result of heavy stigma around this reality. So I'm on number nine and I am getting there. I know that I'm very fortunate that Toronto's Lee Chapman helped my family. Lee is a nurse and she works in the area of overdose prevention at Moss Park and she's a doctoral candidate here at the University of Toronto. She advises to get to City Works as soon as possible, Toronto Public Health Clinic that provides OAT and in particular Suboxone. And I know from having spoken to them that the folks at City Works here in Toronto need more support. They look exhausted. So Lee was instrumental in my son's survival. Hers was badly needed help that came from outside the healthcare system, 
I connected with her through Facebook. Mothers talk about an underground railroad. Recently, I agreed to visit a young man who was on an infectious disease ward here in Toronto. His mother was in Asia and extremely distressed. I know that recently another mother put out an SOS when her son was sitting by himself in an ER in Vancouver after having OD. He'd been told he had to wait for a detox bed. His mother was also far away. We're talking about young adults here who have their own lives. They don't necessarily live in the same province as someone who might provide care. And mom stopped to harm mom in Quebec, networked with a mom out west to arrange for two other mothers in BC to go and find the young man. Apparently, he left the emergency room to go to a shelter to use already. For many youth, death is lingering just around the corner because, as you know, street drugs are now lethal. I know many mothers who've fallen into poverty, having spent their entire re retirement savings on private, unregulated addiction rehab centers that have failed their children, one stint after another. And I know that many of our kids are dying shortly after leaving rehab, leaving grieving mothers and fathers without their child, siblings without their brothers and sisters, and families without adequate bereavement support or financial support in old age. <coughs> I'm on number 15 now. I know that a great many family members have found themselves sitting in court with their kids. That's an experience to be experienced. I know that some Ontario mothers have youth in long-term remand situations in other provinces. In one case, in the Edmonton remand facility. And these mothers live terrified, for good reason. Recently, a court determined that the Section 12 rights of substance user were infringed by the way he was treated in that particular facility. I know that many of our kids are dying of overdoses very shortly after leaving prison, where they've been locked up as a result of the war on drugs. I know that some people hide their children's situation as a result of extreme stigma. One of my closest friends who I've known for 18 years did this with me. She knew all about my situation, but she bore the terror alone. Miraculously, her daughter survived the overdoses and the life that came with the, her use of substances, and in part, my friend credits Suboxone with this. I know that a lack of safe drug supply forces people to buy on the street, and to be arrested, and I know because I've seen it, and I've been told about it. Finally, to note that Leslie McBain, who's another co-founder of Mom Stop the Harm, has stated that the opioid crisis has torn a rent in the fabric of Canadian culture, and I think that's true. As an advocate, knowing what's happening out there, we have to find the political will to build a bridge over these dangerous waters that swirl around ever more of us. And thank you for listening. So my second question would have been about the drug regulatory context, but I think um, uh, Sheila already put us more into the context of what is concretely not happening on, in, on the street and what, what can be done, and maybe I'll ask you to comment about that, and we'll, then we'll take a step back and look at some of the components of drug regulation and the common law. Uh, if I maybe can ask from your perspective as policy researchers, so what's your, what's your sense of when you hear Sheila speak about what initiatives are, are, are being currently undertaken that you're aware of and what is still lacking? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, first of all, thank you, both of you, for your comments, and I think uh, Sheila really touched on so many important points, I think, that you know from personal experience, and that I think we're, we're, we're all appreciating more and more as, as this crisis has continued to unfold over decades now, and, and it's such a shame to me that, it's not even a shame, it's, 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 horrible to me that we have known this for so much time and that we're still not finding the right policy responses and we're still not as dense at mobilizing resources and policymakers to actually respond in a way um, that, that we think can be effective. Um, I think, and, and coming back to one of your points, Sheila, around, you know, we have to stop the deaths, right? I mean, there are so many policy options that can come around appropriate prescribing and 
are all different parts of this issue. But really, I think our priority right now with the deaths that are happening is we have to stop the deaths. That has to be our main priority. We can deal with that other stuff as it comes. We need to stop people from dying mm -hmm. from from a uh, you know a, a medical condition that comes up when you when when you um, have a dependence or opi on these on these drugs or an opioid use disorder and you can't um, get the, the safe supply or the treatment or whatever it is that, that, that you want or need. So I do think we need to focus on harm reduction. There have been investments in harm reduction, but I think, you know, for example, in Ontario right now, the supervised consumption sites, the fact that they've been capped at 19, I think it is, 21. or 21, with, with really no ability to expand that. 21 sites isn't even probably enough for the city of Toronto, let alone the province, if you think about all of the people that need access to these, these um, resources and it's you, for all of us we can't imagine you know you go to fill your prescription at a pharmacy if it's 10 kilometers away you're much less likely to want to go and do that today than if it's around the corner and that's the same for people who are trying to access services if they are a 10 minute drive away it's understandable that most people can't do that drive in more rural and remote communities can't access these services and having you know one service in Kitchener for example is not enough it's just it's just not okay so I think we made some progress initially in, in getting some movement in opening these sites. The point's already raised, it was a little too little too late, and it took way too long for that to happen. But we started to make some gains there, and then we got this arbitrary cap. And I think you know for, that's one example to me of a policy where we started to actually see some positive change. And I'd be curious to hear what both of you think, but to me it's just so unacceptable that we're in this position now where something that has been proven to work to prevent overdoses from being fatal and, and to provide community and networking for people who use drugs is just being um, cut off or, or capped in such an arbitrary way and, and the, the model is even being forced to change in a way that, that may not actually be as effective for people. So focusing in on one piece and around that avoidance of death, I think that you know that's one area where I'm personally um, feel is a huge gap right now and needs, needs some serious change. So, so this restriction of the uh, sites is a, a little bit the same way that people want, don't want to have a home shelter next to, there's the same kind of stigmatization and the same kind of avoiding of the same idea that they don't want to attract problems to the yes. neighborhood. I think that's part of it, um, but I, I mean beyond that, even if people were okay with having them open, they can't be now. This, the government won't approve any new ones. So if you can't even approve any new ones, then even if you have people saying, yes, please provide this service, if you have amazing advocates like Sheila saying, getting people in a community brought together to say, we need this and we have a space for it, we can't do it. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Then any comments? Uh, yeah, comment. Um, you know, I was talking to some of the some people at South River Dell Community Health Center a couple days ago. So they they run one of their one of the city supervised consumption sites, and we got onto the topic of the exemptions that they had to acquire from Health Canada to open the site. We're currently my group is currently working with some frontline organizations to set up street drug checking systems. Um, at these supervised consumption sites, so people will be able to show up, provide a sample of their drugs, and then have them analyzed so they actually know what they might be using. We've been facing, you know, so on the one hand, Health Canada funded our funded this work uh, and uh, basically stated that these sites had to open April 1st, 2019. On the other hand, these the street drug checking service requires uh, Section 56 exemption to run, which is also provided by Health Canada, but from a different unit. We have, we're now at month seven since we've submitted our application for an exemption, and we're not going to get it by the end of the month. So you have Health Canada, you have the Minister of Health going out, making all these statements about how, so in this case, street drug checking is a in, super important part of the response to the opioid crisis. Meanwhile, you have two units directly competing with each other. One funding, one essentially throwing up barriers to their opening. And the end result is that basically people are not going to know what they're using. 
so they can make educated choices about you know how much to use or whether to use in the serious consumption site whether to use, you know whether to use with a friend whether to have naloxone on hand so you know my we were all we're all very frustrated by the delays so this person in South Riverdale was like oh that's nothing when we wanted to establish the surprise consumption sites, it took us about a year. Like we didn't hear back from the exemption office for eight months. Wow, you you heard back in five months? That's amazing. So when Toronto moved, so when the federal government decided to allow supervised consumption sites, and when Toronto moved to open some, the evidence was already in. Like we are talking about. Like on the one hand, the issues that we're talking about are driven by very complex structural drivers, like the ones that Tara described. But on the other hand, some of the result, some of the interventions are already there, and they're extremely simple. You have a room, you have clean injecting equipment, and you have a medical professional on hand. How approving something like that takes a year? when there's like 40 peer-reviewed scientific papers and not just, you know, four, four lines in a, of a brief report. Like, it, it boggles the mind. It is so frustrating. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. Like, I, there, there are these kinds of barriers everywhere you look. You look at the, you know, you look at the, the minister, Ministry of Ontario, or, yeah, what is it, Minister of, Health and long term care in the HLTC. Um, which has essentially, and I'm sorry if there are members of that ministry here, but they have ceded leadership completely on this issue. They have not led on this issue at all. There has been zero support. And frankly, you know, and this, is, this predates this administration, like our provincial administration. Um, but it has only gotten worse. And, you know, you look at, at the priorities stated by the current, the Ford administration, which basically said, well, we, we're gonna, like you said, we're gonna cap it, right? We're gonna cap the number of supervised consumption sites. What the implication there is that they believe that supervised consumption sites somehow enable drug use, right? They're never gonna say that, but when you say, okay, well, you can only have 20, instead of we will open as many sites as required to stop overdose, to have sufficient coverage for everyone who's at risk of overdose. Like when, you, when you're when you not using that kind of language, it's very clear what the implication is. The implication is, I don't care what the evidence says, I don't care if they save lives, they enable drug use. And they'll never state that because it's not politically correct, but they clearly believe it if you look at the policy actions that they've taken. And the most galling, aspect of it is that so a few months ago they said okay well we'll allow supervised <coughs> consumption sites to continue if they somehow demonstrate linkages to treatment which on its face is wonderful but what you do in, pr in practice is create tons of uncertainty in these sites and the people who are running them to the point that they're not able to expand services to treatment because they haven't been provided any additional funding to do to do that but also they're too busy filling out forms and worrying about their future that they cannot plan strategically to expand the number of services that they offer because they're so worried about whether they are simply going to survive or not this is all to say that you know the one tool and the one weapon of government is bureaucracy and they and and multiple levels of government be it um, you know provincial provincially and federally they have used bureaucracy as some kind of super inefficient tool and also as a very strategic weapon and in both cases it's just led to delays like the evidence is extremely clear and you know you, the, the experience, not, and I'm not just talk, talking about scientific evidence, like the evidence in terms of the experience of what has happened in Canada and ways that we know how to mitigate overdose risk. Like it's all extremely clear at this point. And we are unfortunately just 
absolutely lacking in political will. And uh, it's super unfortunate. Sorry to be a downer, but you know, it's, you just, like, I will share one anecdote with you. I went to the MOHLTC and I had a meeting with someone and I was like, okay, well, we're trying to, we're trying to help um, implement some novel opioid addiction or uh, opioid agonist therapies in frontline settings like your government wants, right? You want, we're, we want to offer science, like evidence-based treatments like hydromorphone, diacetylmorphine, things that for which there are multiple meta-analyses <laughs> and systematic reviews. Who can help me do this? Like, let's get the MOHLTC on board. And the person I talked to was like, oh. And I was like, do we write a letter? Like, can I get a bunch of people together to write a letter demonstrating that there is political will and will among people in this field that we need this, these services offered? And they were like, yeah, you know, I just don't think you should be worried about, like, I, I'd be worried about ruffling feathers. I swear to God, I swear to God, they were like, don't say anything publicly because you will ruff, ruffle feathers and ruin your relationship with people in charge of policy. I mean, that is just like, and that is like cultural, right? That is like an institutional culture. And if that's the kind of concern that is top of mind, it's gonna take a lot of work. Me? Okay. So, safe, uh, supervised consumption sites do form part of a larger harm reduction package, um, which go along with numerous other things, obviously, like uh, clean needles, so you're not sharing your Hep C and your HIV um, with your friends. Um, but where we are at Mom Stop the Harm, that is just part of it and on its own even where there there are robust sites um, there are huge lineups there and people are concerned about the degree to which they can assist people who are coming in to inject who may need assistance because there's this fear of losing their exemption status so there's a lot of issues around safe injection sites uh, supervised consumption sites um, I just wanted to comment on the number of 21 because of the absurdity of it to me that just feels like a back of the envelope policy decision and we're all waiting for that policy window to open up and there is a huge disconnect between what common sense tells us and what uh, we're hearing from different people in different realms right so the obvious thing that we need is we need um, a safe supply of drugs for our kids um, which really rings weird in many people's ears um, because as long as they don't have that, they'll be texting for the heroin from someone out there that they don't know. Um, and that is never going to stop. Um, and that just takes my mind off in, a, in an odd direction. Um, safe supply. And we need to stop arresting primarily young men, but young women as well, for having a dirty needle in their backpack or having a tiny amount of personal possession um, why is that a crime? Um, we need to hold, we need to revisit criminal law, and um, you know it's all encased in the war on drugs, which has um, died a long and painful death, and we just don't seem to be ready to bury it yet. And I think that that's the thing that we really need to be examining: is why are we holding on to the war on drugs, and what are we really afraid of um, in terms of um, safe supply? I think that's the other thing that needs to be looked at. So um, in, terms of, in terms of these pauses on sites where people are waiting, there is this concept that justice delayed is justice denied. Um, and having access to a place that will help you stay alive when all your friends are dying is social justice. So social justice is part of what's being denied. Um, and I think that policymakers need to wake up and smell the coffee because this issue isn't going away. And people who use drugs have the same rights as everybody else. And they are now in a state of mind to start asserting uh, their rights and claiming their rights so that they can realize their <coughs> rights. That's it. Thank you.
Okay. Um, we want to leave time for questions. I, I realize there's so much to be said. Um, it was probably not realistic to cover both the kind of the, the problems related to uh, legal prescription of opioids and the marketing of opioids and the, and the, the more day-to-day um, -day crisis that we currently have. So, so <clears throat> let me try to focus more on what we've already covered, uh, the issues around opioid regulations. We may touch on it at the end, but let me focus more on what are the other players in this? So we mentioned already the provincial ministries of health. We mentioned uh, Health Canada <clears throat> with respect to um, two permissions that have to be given. Uh, and, um, so what about public health agencies? What about the drug? The, what about the uh, regulatory colleges of nurses and physicians? So maybe if you can comment, uh, in, you don't have to comment the three of you, but those who are interested or have done some work and have some ideas about what they are, what they are doing, what their role is, um, where they should be going. I could, uh, yeah, really briefly on the colleges, like there, so we're in a situation right now in Ontario where there is very, there's essentially no direction from the Ontario colleges of physicians and surgeons or nurses or pharmacists on whether it's a whether it's appropriate or essentially I'm not I don't want to use the word legal because I don't think that's exactly what they're what they do but essentially whether the colleges would would sanction um, their members to provide novel forms of treatment for addiction for opioid use disorder so so here again we're talking about things like hydromorphone um, Dicetylmorphine, aka heroin. Um, these are really well established treatments that have been used um, for the past few decades in um, Western Europe. They're being prescribed in uh, British Columbia. I think they're starting to be prescribed in Alberta as well. And the situation we have, you know, th these are like methadone and buprenorphine, these are opioid based formulations, right? So you are providing people with substitution therapy so that they can manage their opioid use disorders and are not reliant on an illegal drug supply that, as we know, is increasingly toxic. So this could be, and, and, and for a lot of people, methadone and buprenorphine are, you know, the, the majority of people who uh, are enrolled in patient-oriented care, like methadone or buprenorphine plus, some psychosocial interventions and additional structural supports, they can do really well. Um, for a minority of people, they, methadone and buprenorphine are not effective. And those are often the people that are at highest risk of overdose. So one really effective way to prevent overdose death is <coughs> by tailoring services, treatment, for that minority of people who have, for whom conventional Frontline therapies, first line therapies for addiction treatment are not appropriate. The problem we have in Toronto or in in Ontario is that right now these formula, uh, these these uh, medicines like hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid, its trade name, are not uh, uh, what's what's the term? They're 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 basically on the formulary for um, pain management. So. A physician or a pharmacist or a nurse cannot work with a patient and use these, um, like a hydromorphone based for, uh, medication, to manage their substance use disorder, their opioid use disorder, because they might be liable if something goes wrong. And the way to um, deal with that liability is to have the colleges take a stand and say, well, actually, you know, the evidence suggests that this is appropriate care for opioid use disorder, which would then provide coverage for all, um, you know, physicians and nurses and pharmacists to start providing this level of care. But without the leadership of the colleges, like, and, you know, if you're a healthcare professional and you want to start doing that, you're basically on your own. Like, you take on the liability yourself, you could lose your license, you could be sued, 
you, you, you know, like the personal risks are so high. So it has created this dampening effect where, um, you know, maybe there's like a handful of people who are prescribing hydromorphone in Ontario, but they're really out there on a, on a limb. So, so one thing that really needs to happen is pressure on the colleges, or at least the colleges, to come forward and state like these treatments are appropriate. This is standard of care, um, and you know that would be one really simple regulatory change um, that could have an outsized impact because it would f it would really free up a lot of people, medical professionals, to start engaging in a fulsome way in providing care for people who are at greatest risk of overdose. It's one of the the problems there may be that one, that one of the, or, or the origins of the opioid crisis is associated with prescription behavior and that the attitude has been more on trying to, trying to clamp down on over prescription. Could that be a factor that? So I think, you know, quite possibly, I think one of, one of the things that happened was you basically had, like, Opioid use disorder is complicated and it's complicated to treat. And one of the reasons it's complicated to treat is that symptoms of opioid use disorder can resemble symptoms of physical pain. So if you're, if you have a patient who say, say had, you know, like an injury to their back and you were providing them with pain management, it's not entirely clear if they become dependent that, that sim the, those symptoms initially are going to be that different from the actual physical manifestations of pain. So I think, you know, you've got physicians that historically were over-prescribing and then potentially found themselves in a situation where too late they realized that no, not, now I'm dealing with an opioid dependent patient and then essentially had to like freestyle their way through it, right? Mm -hmm because there isn't a working system of addiction um, medicine uh, mm -hmm. across the province, right? So, so then you've got physicians essentially on their own trying to manage somebody's opioid use disorder without any training using the only tool that they have, which is uh, you know, an opioid medication. I think that, so that might lead to some hesitancy. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're also in a position where Thankfully, there's increasing national guidelines that are being developed. So, like, there's guidelines that were, that were recently developed in British Columbia for, um, you know, injectable opioid agonist treatments like injectable hydromorphone, um, which is a treatment that's been found to be really effective for people who experience some forms of opioid use disorders, um, which can hopefully kind of break the ice a little bit with the colleges and and help them understand that, yeah, there, oh, there are protocols for not only patient, like managing patients in this condition, but also dispensing treatment and, um, you know, this is standard of care and results are, you know, have been demonstrated to be effective. Mm -hmm. you want to say yeah, that? I just wanted to comment, um, to follow up on something that you were saying. There does seem to be, I have here a letter from the Ontario College of Physicians and Sir, uh, um, Ontario College of Family Physicians that was sent to Lynn Carson and myself, and Lynn is another lawyer. Um, and similarly, we have someone here from Families for Addiction and Recovery, and one of the founding members of that organization is also a lawyer. And the fact that we're lawyers um, with knowledge about addiction, and we're asking the colleges, could you please at least train the family doctors in how to use Suboxone, we get the brush off. And that is something that, you know, I come from a medical family, my father was a doctor, my ex-husband was a doctor, my sister's a surgeon, I know the language. We still get brushed off. So the fact that you could have medical knowledge and be a lawyer, it doesn't matter. They, you know, this, this um, is it Mr. Glenn Brown said, while other organizations may be better positioned to address some of the issues you raise in your letter, the Ontario College of Family Physicians has a role to play. Um, and then they talk about the fragmented nature of services. So this letter was to ask the college to train physicians, family physicians, to at least um, help manage addiction in long-term patients. Like, we have a wonderful family doctor. We've had her for 18 years. Um, but she does not have the training. She wasn't provided the training. And this talks about 
tapering and this and that. It doesn't talk about the homeless population. It's completely out of touch. And that is a huge concern. And I know that uh, Angie Hamilton um, at Families for Addiction Recovery, I've seen the letters. There's tons to CAPE, right, to all of these organizations. Um, and it just falls on deaf ears. So we're just left wondering if we can't get a decent response, who can? Sorry for the frustration. It's just, you know, it's really awful. Yeah. And I just, uh, I, I totally agree with everything that's being said. And I think, kind of going back to your question of, you know, who are the other players, I think we touched on, you know, the, the, the role of the colleges as, as having a really important role. What's also come up, and I think is really important, is the role of, of universities and, and medical schools in particular, making sure that they train um, physicians and pharmacists, but largely physicians, in two things. In pain management that is not reliant on evidence that is biased from pharmaceutical companies, but is actual true pain management. Because we can't forget that there are people with chronic pain with acute pain that need treatment. And on training people on how to actually treat opioid use disorder and how to make those connections for people. Because we need graduates who are coming out of these training environments who are able to actually treat people. Chronic pain is one of the, the biggest um, uh, reasons for people to go see their family <coughs> doctor and, and oftentimes there's not a lot of training that happens in medical school about that. And we know that there's a huge population of people with opioid use disorder now and if we can't create trainees and new medical graduates who actually feel equipped to deal with these issues, then I think we have a huge issue coming up. Um, the other thing that I would raise is, and Shelley mentioned this a little earlier, but is also the role of you know correctional services in this. There's a whole <coughs> issue of criminalization and all of the downstream effects. But even before that, we have people who are going into the correctional system who are no longer able to access treatment. So they were stabilized on treatment, can't access it anymore, or want to start treatment and are given the opportunity to do so. And then when they leave prison, they have lost their tolerance to drugs and they use drugs again and overdose. And so not only is the criminalization, a, the broader conversation around that I think has a lot of problems with it, but just that sequence of entering and leaving the correctional system creates such a dangerous environment for people. And we need to try to understand why, if you could provide insulin to somebody with diabetes going into a correctional facility, why can't you provide methadone or buprenorphine to them and provide that continuity of care? Or if somebody wants to start when they enter into the correctional system, why can't you provide them that care? And it comes back to the stigma and the fact that people that clinicians aren't comfortable um, also prescribing these, these medications and aren't trained to do it. So I think there are a lot of roles beyond even just the colleges of all these other parts of the system that really have to start to become more self-aware of their gaps as well as the ingrained stigma that they might have around this issue and how they can get past that. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the, that last point about Essentially, if you do not have a structure, like if you don't have protocols in place, physicians can just decide that they're against methadone or against buprenorphine. Like they can just decide that. <laughs> if they do not have, there isn't a system of, you know, protocols for treatment, like then essentially it's just up to their personal choice. Pharmacists can decide they won't carry naloxone yeah. because they don't want those people coming into their pharmacies. It's ridiculous, right? You can't, how can you not provide a life-saving medication that is the government's providing for free because you see a stigma with that, a, a stigma with that population? Uh, we did a study a while ago calling pharmacies across Canada pretending we were looking for naloxone and asking if they had it. And it's terrifying the degree to which pharmacies just say, oh no, we don't have that, you can go to a different pharmacy. Well, why are we making people shop around to pharmacies to get access to something like naloxone? Um, it's just, it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. when, when you give these examples, it's so uh, striking that we have at the start of the opioid crisis, certainly this uh, easy over-prescription of, uh, of uh, regular drugs huh? as, a, as one of the core issues. Your point about the uh, role of ac academia and, and universities is ob obviously quite important in this context also because it relates to something that I, I wanted to discuss but we won't have time for that, which is the, the need for independent information and knowledge production um, which is not sponsored by industry. And so in, um, Dan, you, you wrote uh, for, for, for advice and a piece in which you, um, you talked about the experience at the University of Toronto of uh, industry-sponsored um, pain 
lectures which yeah. misrepresented the um, the uh, addictive nature of OxyContin, which which uh, uh, raises issues about how to control marketing that we won't discuss in detail today. But um, one of the discussions we had that uh, we have had at the at the advisory committee is is um, should we start and, and can we legally start treating scientific publications as forms of marketing when they really are? Uh, but it's, so it's interesting that you have to kind of think out of the box about how to regulate the creation of information in this particular context. Uh, I, I will stop here with the kind of questions that I have from, from prepared because there's so, many, so much more to be discussed, but I want to open it up briefly for questions normally. I go through questions that the students have asked me. I would say to the students, many of these things have been answered. So if you have a particular thing that wasn't answered, put up your hand. But otherwise, I will just look at the people who put up their hand, and I will start with you. Yeah, one question. We didn't talk about the uh, harms of non-fatal overdoses, what it's done to the body. There's a lot of those. And we mentioned, the panel mentioned addiction. That's stigma causing word. The root word for addict is slave. We have to help these people out. As everyone's family member, drugs have been around forever. If someone hadn't looked after your ancestors, poof, you wouldn't be here today. Think about it. How many people have used drugs, save non drug users? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I'm going to take a minute. Um, I want to thank the panel and everything. And I want to, my question, or my, what I want to see is don't give up. It's so easy to say, oh my goodness. What I want to say here is, this is my son. Now he's not at this table because he's dead. And he's dead because of all of what you brought up, all the obstacles, all the barriers against harm reduction. This is a boy that was in recovery, that was trying his best, struggling, and every bullet point that you brought up, we've stood behind that. We've been in the courts, we've been in the emergency rooms, we've been hospitals, we've rehab, and this boy tried, and he would be at this table defending his friends right now. He went to so many funerals, until the day where he couldn't try anymore and he went to a parking lot and died. Now I'm here today as a mother because I won't give up. I'm not giving up. On his behalf, on the behalf of every child or every child breathing and every child has passed, something has to be done. And in order, while we're doing all the discussion and the academia, we have to keep these children breathing. We can't just wait for the next report to come up, right? Where does breath, there's hope. And I hope that we get some answers and some changes. Thank you. Here's your short point. Orlando De Silva, the president of the Ontario Law Society at the Bell Let's Talk in 2018, made a statement, he overdosed. I would call it EMS. Right up on the belt, I'd stop it. Not, not, really, not very snorkel in the ceremony. So it can happen anyway. 50,000 poisonings per year in this province. 28,000 from our children. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did China deal with the opioid con uh, problems they had? hundreds of years ago? Well, I mean, part of that was like structurally imposed, right? Through British imperialism. Is that what you mean? No, I mean this. Like prior to that. British imperialism brought the opioids. It's the what solution uh, helped China overcome this hundreds of years ago? I feel like you know the answer. <laughs> well, I, I don't. Do you? Well, uh, actually, I don't know the answer. Oh. But it seems to me, I uh, hear you talking, and each of you has your own points. It's a bit like a rant. And it happened before. Something was done, 
and some solutions must have come out. But well, who knows about those? Who's looking at those things that help <coughs> as opposed to the individual pieces that you look at? Well, they had a safe supply. They could just go and smoke their opium in an opioid den. But, right? No, no. That, yeah, but I mean, there was a solution to the problem <laughs> of the opioid den. Those were imposed on them. So, so what, I, what I would say is, you know, the history of humanity's relationship with opium, it's not 100 years old, it's not 500 years old, it's not 1,000 years old, it's like 10,000 plus years old. There is, there is evidence that opium is, with wheat, one of the oldest known cultivated plants. The point that no one's quite sure where it actually emerged initially because it was quickly planted and seeded in so many different regions of the world. So, you know, I, I would push back a little bit on the notion that um, opium is a problem to be solved. And in point of fact, you know, methadone, morphine, uh, these are on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And that's for a reason. Our relationship, we have, and, I, and this is not hyperbole, we have co-evolved with the opium poppy to the point that, you know, it's one of the most mutually effective relationships um, that humanity has with any other living organism. So, you know, there has been use of opium essentially since the beginning of civilization. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think, frankly, that's, it is not a problem that requires a solution. There are many different reasons why people use drugs to manage pain, for, um, uh, for pleasure. Um, and, you know, rather than trying to find a solution to drug use in and of itself, like I, I understand that it sounds like a rant, um, but at the same time, like, I think all of us are looking at a very complicated structure that is impeding what appear to be really simple solutions. So, like that's what we do day in and day out. Um, and it's again, you know, I think I assume I speak for all of us that I don't think any of us are, are see the drug in and of itself as the problem. It's really um, removing all of the structural drivers that take what could be a pretty innocuous um, decision, which is to use a drug or not, and turns it into a life or death decision. I have, sorry, I have a question. I know that um, other stigmatized areas of, um, especially with criminal law, so for instance, uh, medical assisted with dying, things like that, have um, gone through, I think, the phases that you guys have discussed where you reach out to people, you ask for the policies to change, and you receive the brush off and the bureaucratic roadblocks. And I was curious if you, where you think there could be room for litigation in this area from a charter perspective. I know that there has been some with Insight, um, but do you think that that's the right next step, or do you think that it would not lead to the results that you want? Do, yeah, I mean, well, you know, I think it would be really effective. I'll, I'll suggest one example in which I thought I think litigation or the threat of litigation has been really effective, which is in the case of uh, clean needle and syringe distribution in prisons. So the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network for a number of years has been building a case um, essentially on the principle of equivalence, right, where people based on the principle of equivalence whereby people who are incarcerated have a right to the same level of health care as people who are in the community at large. And they were, I think, my understanding is they were very close to launching uh, litigation against the federal government because somebody had been in prison, had used a tainted needle, or a contaminated needle, I should say, and uh, was infected, I think, with hep C. I can't remember exactly, either Hep C or HIV. And they were, you know, essentially like made it clear that they were going to launch this litigation. And then all of a sudden, Correction Services of Canada announced after 
decades of opposition, that they were going to allow needle and syringe distribution in prison. So I think that's like one really clear example of a win. Um, that's a great question though, like in, in terms of how, you know, like, I, I don't know, in, in a way, if the government is stating that they're in the business of providing a safe supply and people are still dying because of tainted drugs, like I wonder if there's something there, but I'm not wondering. Can I just come back very quickly to um, the point around the China opium, opium dens. I just want to, I think there is one example that a lot of people say, which is the Portugal example, which um, I do think is an example of where there was an issue of opioid overdose and there was a very specific approach taken mm -hmm. there, which has been demonstrated to be quite successful in that situation where they, um, you know, decriminalized possession and then reinvested, didn't just stop there, but reinvested that money into providing, you know, access to treatment and other supports for people. And that is something that a lot of people talk about as being one way in which we need to start to learn from those kinds of examples. So I definitely take your point that there are examples we can learn from in the past. I feel a bit, and I don't know enough about this, but that the opium dens in China might be, things have changed so much, even since Portugal, in terms of the role of illicit fentanyl, that there are some questions as to how effective that would be in the situation. But I think we can learn from where there have been successes and how we can then try and use those models in our situation as well. So I definitely agree that there are opportunities for us to continue to learn from what's happened in the past. Just mm -hmm. following up on that, there's a similar thing was done in Liverpool, right, in England, since the 1980s, um, saving people's lives. And people don't really seem to know very much about that, but I think that the compassion clubs in BC, the heroin compassion clubs, are, are sort of modeled on the Liverpool model. Um, but the fact that we don't all know about that is, is pretty revealing. There's also, if we're talking successes here, I, I understand that's a really important piece to remain optimistic. Um, Switzerland in 1993 was facing what they, what the country believed was a, essentially a crisis of public disorder related to drug use. So the Swiss were really motivated, not by overdose, not really by disease transmission or anything like that related to drug use, really just public disorder. So people injecting the parts. Swiss, very pragmatic, conservative people, um, looked at the issue and essentially didn't, you know, scale up law enforcement, scaled up supervised consumption sites, access to evidence-based treatment, including heroin-assisted treatment. Um, they also increased access to needles and syringes, both in communities and in prisons. And within, uh, so in 1993, they did a census and essentially 20% of the people who injected drugs in Switzerland reported that they had been injected in public in the past six months. Within two years, that dropped to like 3%, and then has just essentially declined since 1993 on a low and slow trajectory downwards. At the same time, the, num the incident cases of people starting to inject drugs dropped from a similar number of like 20% down to like 5%, down to 3%, in 1993, there were about 850 people who were initiating injection drug use per year. By you know a decade later, it was like under 50, and I think now it's you know it's just been steadily declining. So they they created a, a certain stability, right? Um, and uh, but part of that was this rapid scale up. So and the, the, there are two pieces there, right? One is the speed with which you do something. And the second is the coverage. And that's where, you know, for all the well-meaning policy that's being talked about in Canada, there's neither speediness nor sufficient coverage for, you know, any of the interventions that we're talking about that we know can be effective. On that note, I think we have to stop, but it's clear that there has to be uh, much more than discussion on this, and so um, we'll have to uh, have you come back, but, uh, but we certainly will have a session in the in the fall, looking at particularly in relation to the last question, what can the role of law be? Litigation, uh, litigation to cover the expenses of the opioid crisis. So, had some notes uh, prepared for that, but didn't have time to discuss it. The fact that um, BC is currently suing um, the, the producers, the distributors, the, the, the pharmacy chains that have been selling opioids to recover some of the costs related to the, to the opioid. Uh, 
crisis. Um, there is a, a discussion to be held about the role of charter litigation for access to access to health. There is a discussion to be held about the role of the criminal law in prosecuting um, uh, drug producers, pharmaceutical producers, and obviously also still the illegal trafficking that, that is certainly creating a toll on the system. Uh, on, so uh, please join me in thanking our presenters on the uh,